Um, okay. Good morning, everybody, I'm, uh, or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are. Very happy to be here at Living Knowledge 9 at this panel with uh, Hannah Clinch and Fumio Murayama on um, using the SDGs and Green Map together. Um, we're going to do, uh, I'll do an overview. Fumio will talk about his work in Japan. Hannah will talk about her work in Scotland and then we'll do a demo. So that's the, the run of the, the time. We actually have carved out two hours, which is really long. So feel free to leave if you need to, pop in with questions anytime, and, or you can wait, we'll take a little break. We'll stop it between each person, see if you have questions. But hopefully this is a dialogue and comes out with some new tools for you and for us as well. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, oops. There we go. And you can all see this, right? You all know the, that at the top of Zoom, you have a, a button where you can change the size of your screen so it fits better. And if you hover over the bottom, you'll see tools for raising your hand and things like that, popping the chat window out. Um, so um, welcome everybody and really happy that um, we're together here today, um, a little over just about a year later than we were originally supposed to do this panel, but um, happy to see everybody looking healthy. And so what is a green map? It's locally made, it uses green map icons, and it highlights the uh, nature, culture, social justice, and sustainable living resources. It's up to local people to determine which of those to emphasize, how to, uh, oops, sorry. I should hit the present button here, shouldn't I? Hey, there we go. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> um, so the many, many different types of groups have made green maps over the years. And for some, it's a grassroots organizing tool. It can be a planning process. It can be a welcome to new, newcomers. There's so many different ways that this project can help people uh, connect with local uh, re resources for green living or to address local challenges. Um, linking all of this effort that's individualized around the world is the green map icons. And right now there's 170 of them and they have been in use since about 1995 and continually evolving and um, they're now open source. And as you can see, we link them to the SDGs chart by chart, but a little bit more about the projects, how people use the icons, greenmap.org is where they share their story. Then we have open green map platforms as the place to um, 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 actually make your maps if you wanna make digital maps. Um, what we do here in New York and actually in other places where there's green map hubs is we connect projects, share outcomes, and we create new tools. We're continually assessing where was the difficult places for people, what kinds of new technologies there are. And we also had the great experience of working together with several map makers to make different kinds of guides and books. Um, all of this is available free at greenmap.org. Um, actually, Green Map um, got started right across from the UN. And uh, 1990, at the end of 1991, I had the idea of making a Green Map for New York, the Green Apple Map, as the Earth Summit was taking, the planning meetings for the Earth Summit, which was in Rio in 1992, were taking place. Um, we're really happy that we have a wonderful uh, new mapping platform to share with you. So we'll be showing some of that later. Um, but we're gonna focus right now on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I think probably everybody has seen this chart somewhere. Um, these goals are not just uh, graphics. They're also heavy duty um, guidelines for countries, for businesses, for schools. They can be used so many different ways. Sorry, 
I know that's a lot of blinking. Um, but here is, if you actually dive in, you'll see that each one of these goals is broken down into a number of targets and indicators. And it's very serious business. Um, we wish there were more places that were reporting according to the system because it's much easier, I think, for people to grasp what's going on at that level, where, where change is being made. Um, there's, if you go into the materials about the SDGs, there's a lot of information <laughs> about how not to use the little ring and um, how to use their tools. But they've really encouraged creativity and people have all over the Kind of all over the world created different kinds of engagements so that people can become more familiar with them, start using them every day. I found that it's actually a little bit confusing for people, some of the terminology used and the ideas. So we thought, how can we help make these goals more understandable and started to look for how are they broken out different ways. So here's a chart that to me makes more sense than the official chart because how they've broken it out by planet, people, prosperity, and partnerships for peace. So the colors don't necessarily correspond to those um, categories. Here's another example where um, they're looking at the interactions between climate change and biodiversity loss. And there's, you know, really just these three central ones that they're looking at, but they're, um, focusing out to all the other 17 goals. It's quite quite interesting, I think, how um, these are being used to date. So we started wondering, are they going to be useful for our movement? Can we mix the local energy and knowledge that people have to help raise the visibility and also the credibility of this framework? So we really thought about how different every group is and started looking at, once again, our iconography, and we matched for each each um, each of the 17 goals. We created a chart where we've matched the related icons to it. And there's no technology for this right now, so you have to look at the chart and choose. But we also um, really dove into thinking about what's behind the graphic. Those all those um, indicators and targets we tried to capture with our icon system. And you can download it, as you can see at bit.ly slash gm dash sgg. We'll of course make these slides available later so you can grab the links then if you want. Um, but the chart is there and you can use it in different, um, different locations. And it's not, you're not limited to maps, obviously. Um, we put them into um, the third edition of our guide, Mapping Our Common Ground. So this is the book we co-wrote with Canadian, Brazilian, and Cuban map makers. And it's all about engaging people, getting them involved in a very simple and direct way, get people, everybody at the table. So we've included the full set of charts inside this book, um, the new edition of this book, which is a free PDF that you can download. And um, we also have a mapping platform. New, uh, our new one is at new.opengreenmap.org. You can see down the left some of the um, features of this platform, including in red that you can match, you can mix in your own custom icon set. So you, on our platform, you could add your own icons, use our set and use the SDGs as well, which is also up there as a set. On the right, you can see how our browse page is laid out with maps, icons, and sites. So you can start learning about the SDGs there if you wanted to, just as you're getting into the platform. Um, so if you, uh, this is Mary's map. Mary is here from Washington State on the, on the left. And, oh, excuse me, it's not her map, sorry. This is <laughs> Added Value Farm here in Brooklyn. And so it's a good example of, oh, a place that ha is um, zero hunger, no poverty, although we didn't mark that here yet. On the right, sorry, you can see the Copenhagen uh, map where they only use the SDGs on their markers. So 
you can really see all over town places that match those SDGs. Um, so here's another view of that map from Copenhagen. We created for this workshop a campaign and we're gonna invite you to use it in the second part of this workshop, but a campaign is a quick way to engage people in your map and it's very customizable just like the map itself. So um, now I wanna take a moment and say thank you to our advisors at Green Map. There are 10 people now from around the world who are helping us in many ways, including Fumio Murayama and Hannah Clinch. Hannah made her first green map and started in 2002, so she goes back away. Fumio, when did you make your first map? Okay, I will. When? Uh, 2007, I think, maybe. 2007. Yeah. So everybody yeah. on this list has a long history with us and um, really appreciate all that they're contributing to keeping this movement going forward. I'm going to just say, are there any questions? Should I st I'll stop sharing just for a second and see if there's any questions that anybody has at this point. Shall we go on then with Fumio and he can um, present what they're doing in Japan? Do you want me to turn to do my share or do you want to do it? I can do it maybe. <laughs> okay. 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 Wait a minute. Okay. And let me. Okay. Okay. Uh... Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fumio Murayama. I'm uh, teaching the Japanese Constitution in the Department of Environmental Science at Azabu University in Japan. Even though my major is law, I coordinated I have coordinated community-based learning with students who study environmental science. I have been doing Green Maps since 2007. This time, Wendy invited me to practice, uh, uh, participate in Living Knowledge Festival 2021. I had never had that term science job before. However, I have always practiced the, the exact same approach in terms of uh, respecting the authority of local community and work together to solve local issues and help student learning in the same time. I am excited about the participation in this festival because I would like to implement small, very small science shop using uh, SDGs and Green Map in my laboratory. Right. Okay, oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Uh, now, I would like to show you two movies by student of Azab University. Uh, this is a PR video for our entry into University SDGs Action Award 2020, hosted by the Asahi Shinbun. It's a major newspaper in Japan. Wait a minute. It's a three, three minute movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait. If you have a problem, let me know. I can try. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. さい
誰一人一人抜かずにあーどうしようおまえかって利益しか考えないで地域連携や社会貢献を怠ってきたからよでもどうすればいいかわからないしとても難しいんだよそんなあなたに紹介したいグリーンマップ何それこれを見なさいおおグリーンマップっていうのは地域の環境を確認しより良いものに変えて情報効果にも役立つ重要なツールなのよへえでもそれどう地域連携に役に立つのそれはね突然だけど会社のステークホルダーって何だと思うステークホルダーはうーん消費者や従業員あとは株主なんかなああ模範的な回答ねでも私は思うの持続可能な社会を構築していく上で一番重要なステークホルダーとなるのは子供だと思うのチルドンおお子供そうグリーンマップアイコンはアイコンを使うことで誰でも簡単に作ることができるのだからこそ重要なステークホルダーである子供と一緒に作ることができるのよグレイトこれを使うことで学校や地域の自治体と一緒に地域を考えていくことができるのファンタスティックしかもそれだけじゃないのグリーンマップアイコンはグローバルなものだから外国の人とコミュニケーションツールとして役立つのよオッグッドでも僕も知らなかったしみんな知らないんじゃないかなまあそう思うわよねけど実はグリーンマップは君の知っているあるものにも役立っているの何だと思ううーん何だろうなヒントは最近社会が注目してきているものよ分かった SDGs そう正解したあなたにはこれをあげましょうありがとうございますグリーンマップと SDGs には対応表があるのこれによってグリーンマップから SDGs を通して地域の資源や問題を考えることができるのよなんだよ早速グリーンマップを作りたくなってきたなアディオスアディオス<笑>はい、プラウドオブマイスチューデントベイマッチ。え<笑>に。ああ。おきい。え。おきれみ、おばくとう。おし。おけ。ああ。いつも、マイスチューデントアピアルビデオ。おけ。Uh, there were、uh, 119 entries in this contest, and we won the study tour prize.、Uh, you can watch the presentation at the screen. Also, you know, it's really easy for people to make fun of rural folk and small town communities for talking about the weather a lot. It sounds like they're being shallow, but Something I've kind of noticed about people around here is the weather has a huge impact on people's lives. And so when people talk about the weather or how much. Sorry. Oh, sorry. E, e, e. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. And. Uh, 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 mm, mm, mm. Now it's、uh, my. Okay, so they got the、uh, prize. And then mm, 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 mm.、Uh, after,、uh, okay, okay, okay. And、uh, in September, oh, 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 oh. and then she got the,、uh, oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Okay, so、uh, in September 2020,、uh, we went to Setochi Town in Kagoshima Prefecture to conduct a workshop on SDGs Green Map with local residents. Okay, okay, now、uh, I can show you another.、Uh, now,、uh, here is another video. That I have made for this workshop with my student 
who belong to my laboratory. And uh, please take a look. It, it takes eight minutes. So wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Let me. Hello everyone. I am a student at Azabu University. You know that Japan is located in the far east of Asia, don't you? Azabu University, located in Sagamihara City, Kanagawa Prefecture, consists of the School of Life and Environmental Sciences and the School of Veterinary Medicine. The goal of education and research at Azabu University is symbiosis with the earth, toward a harmonious coexistence of humans, animals, and the environment. We study environmental research and analysis, understanding climate change and biodiversity, as well as environmental education and the SDGs at the Department of Environmental Science in the College of Life and Environmental Sciences. Our campus is filled with living things. We also have a museum of life and facilities that are environmentally friendly. Today, we are going to introduce the SDGs Green Map, where local people subjectively search for and map local resources and issues. Anyone can do it, from children to the elderly. The method of sharing the past and present of the community and drawing the future is suitable for science shop and community-based research. Green Map is a map created with global green map icons developed by Ms. Wendy Brower, an environmental designer in New York. Since 1995, more than 1,000 projects have been carried out in 65 countries around the world. In Japan, the first green map was created in Kyoto in 1997 to coincide with the third session of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Here at Azabu University, we have made green maps several times since 2007. The feature of the green map is that we can search for local resources and issues from our own perspective. The green map, which visualizes regional information using global icons, can be combined with the SDGs icons to create a vision of what we want our community to be in 2030 in relation to the goals of the world. Let's focus on the SDGs. In September 2015, the United Nations adopted Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 2030 Agenda outlines 17 common goals that should be addressed worldwide using partnerships for people, planet, prosperity and peace. These are the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The 17 goals of the SDGs are interrelated, integrated, and indivisible. For example, poverty is caused by complex factors such as ecosystem deterioration and or disasters brought by climate change, gender discrimination, education, employment and so on. In this way, the SDGs are universal in that the 17 goals are interrelated but the specific issues will appear in a variety of ways in each region. Therefore, it is necessary to understand the resources and issues in each region, and take actions to realize the ideal state in 2030 while cooperating and collaborating with various stakeholders. Because the 17 goals of the SDGs are so comprehensive and abstract, it might be difficult to use them to set an agenda for the region. Rather, in order to share the characteristics of a region with many people, the green map icons are useful because they more concretely represent sustainable living, nature, culture and society. First, let's draw local resources and issues with the universal green map icon. Next, refer to the correspondence chart between the green map icons and the SDGs, and attach the SDG icons to the green map as well. 
This correspondence chart was published by Green Map System in 2018, but it is just an example. With this as a guide, you can all figure out which green map icons relate to which SDGs icons. Since 2011, we have been conducting research on biodiversity and practicing community development based in a revived fallow paddy field in Ao Ne, Midori Ku, Sagamahara City. The people of Ao Ne used to live in a subsistence economy with diverse livelihoods such as sericulture, charcoal making, forestry, farming in small fields, and collecting river fish. However, as fossil energy and synthetic fibers become mainstream and integrated into the global market economy, the loss of local livelihoods results in an exodus of people to urban areas in search of work. The population continues to decline, and Ao Ne Elementary School, with four students in all, closed in March 2020. In October 2019, Typhoon No. 19 hit Ao Ne, causing landslides that collapsed houses and killed people. The mainstreaming of fossil fuels has increased CO2 emissions and brought about climate change. In addition, as charcoal and firewood are no longer used and the mainstream of wood has become imported, forests have been neglected, the ground has loosened, and they could not hold up against landslides. In this way, economy and society, energy and climate change, ecosystems and biodiversity are all interrelated. After the typhoon, during the exchange meeting with local residents, we made a green map regarding the old livelihood and life, and related it to the SDGs icons to create the Ao Ne SDGs green map. By creating a green map, it became clear that there were many water wheels in Ao Ne that used the abundant water. Later, we checked at the local museum and found out that there were 34 water wheels in Ao Ne in the 1940s. There was a way of life and livelihood using natural energy. We can't go back to the past, but we can learn from it, transform the present, and create the future. Community development using hydroelectric energy is still valuable today. The SDGs Green Map can be shared with many people by relating local resources and issues to the SDGs. The Green Map system provides not only green map icons and a table of correspondence with SDGs, but also web-based services such as Open Green Map 2. How will you use the SDGs Green Map to create the future of your community? Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for <laughs> listening to my presentation. And my student is a very good at English. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the students involved here. This is, was really com complete, very beautifully done video. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we move on? Okay, um, thank you. And, you know, we can connect you back with Fumio another time, or you can put a question in the chat as well. Um, so, um, what is, let me go back to, oops, where was I? Sharing my screen. Whoop, cancel. Wait a second. <laughs> I have to move my slides ahead. Let me move my slides ahead. And I will be right with you in one second. Okay. And, Stop. Sorry. Um, okay. There we go. So now I'd like to introduce Hannah Clinch from uh, Glasgow and Danoon. She's the co-director of Tacit Design, and she's going to talk to us some about her work. So um, they're in Scotland and a little hint of what's coming up. So um, again, Hannah's uh, also on our um, 
advisory group. Here we are, Hannah, take it away. Thanks, Wendy. So you should be able to see a set of eyes. Is that, can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Great. Right. Well, as Wendy said, um, my name's Hannah, and I'm based in a place called Danoon, which is on the west coast of Scotland. I've had a design practice um, for a long time. I'm trained as a designer, but I take a real interest in community development and um, social enterprise as well. So a lot of my work looks at the interplay between that and, and also cultural heritage. Um, so. The two projects I'm going to talk to you about are, are really linked to this sustainable development goal, which is responsible consumption and production. And I'm just going to talk you through um, two projects. The, one of them is based in Glasgow and the other one is based in Dunoon, so two locations that are quite contrasting. So Glasgow, obviously a big city in the west coast of Scotland, and then Dunoon, a small rural town. Um, they're separated by a river. And the River Clyde comes into my into the conversation uh, later because that's a uh, really key, I suppose, from a, a heritage perspective. The river is is why Dunoon is here, and also why Glasgow um, as a town, as a as a city, developed as well. So just quickly, this is um, the COP26 Glasgow Green Map that's currently in production and um, been coordinated by the Glasgow Eco Trust. Obviously, in the run up to COP. There's a lot of talk about Glasgow, but this is something that is happening right now. So there's a group of volunteers that are producing this on the Open Green Map platform, which we'll see later. Um, but I just thought I'd highlight that. Now, Glasgow as a city is affectionately known as the Dear Green Place. Um, it used to be thought that that was because Glasgow um, meant Green Hollow, but I think it's really because there's um, parks and, and stuff in Glasgow. It was just a term because it was in a very I suppose green looking place that it got that um, that sort of name. Um, and if you look at this, this is a, a sort of plan of Glasgow from about the, from the 19th century um, that really is talking, it looks at the street, street layout of Glasgow. And if you look, it also refers to some of the shipping and stuff that took place in Glasgow that really made the city uh, very, very wealthy um, during the Victorian era and then just the revolution. When I first arrived in Glasgow, though, um, 20 years ago, the Dear Green Place seemed a little bit um, away from what I experienced as both a student and someone who lived in Glasgow, because Glasgow is also famous for tower blocks, um, which are not very green looking, <laughs> for sure. Um, and also, Glasgow, like many cities, had gone through cycles of extreme wealth and then poverty, and it was very dense housing, Glasgow housing, the reason the tower blocks were there because Glasgow uh, essentially had lots of tenement living, so quite dense housing and accommodation for people who migrated into the city during the Industrial Revolution. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever read this book, um, because to me it has a lot of resonance. Uh, it was written in about 1957 by Vance Hackard and pretty much predicts kind of the conundrum we have today with waste. Um, because it, it, he talks about inbuilt obsolescence and all the things that as a marketeer, because he was a marketeer that I think came to pass. So this is a street corner in Glasgow um, with just a discarded chair or two discarded chairs and various other things. And literally, as you walked around the city, you could, you could furnish a house. And indeed, some of the, my best treasured items in my own house uh, come off the street of Glasgow. And it's fairly typical because I think many cities when people sort of want to replace things, it's not always possible to get rid of things responsibly. But one of the things that Glasgow had is an amazing network of charity shops um, and what's called community reuse projects. Interestingly, the links with charity and material reuse go way back in the city. I put just a bit of information here. So in 1599, when, when there was disease and plague in the city and people were chucking out what's called the middens, their middens, um, they started to employ people to um, deal with that waste um, back then. So, and, and they were basically employees and then the profits went into charities. So there's been a long standing social history of charities and people dealing with waste, which I find totally fascinating. Um, so I started looking at this um, really as a bit of a project um, because I've naturally been drawn to charity shops my entire life. Um, and really started to explore the social history of charity shops 
and ended up working in one for a while or volunteering in one for a while. Um, but also detected and from my research and I suppose just work and talking to people who work in social enterprise as well, realised that there was quite a few challenges faced by the sector that was making it less profitable. So things like donations that weren't of a great quality, which actually sort of reduced the amount of money that charity, because they have to actually then pay for stuff to get taken away. And it seems that there was actually quite a few issues then. And keep in mind, this was like back in 2001, 2002, that I was doing this work. So I suppose essentially our literacy around recycling and reuse wasn't that great. Um, so my sort of first green map was one that I um, still think is my favourite project, <laughs> um, which is uh, the Glasgow Guide to Reuse. So we used the cultural heritage of the city's name, the Dear Green Place, um, and then focus on reuse, trying to sort of educate and nudge people into thinking about the waste hierarchy and looking at reuse as opposed to recycling, um, because there's subtle differences there, obviously. We got an illustrator on board to do that project. So um, someone called Frankie Finch. And I worked um, over the course of a couple of years to pull together all the information and data. It was done on a voluntary basis, although we did end up getting funding um, from the city council eventually, which was a bit of a turnaround. During that project though, we were very dependent on volunteers who came to a place in Glasgow called the Electron Club, which was an open source um, advocacy space to try and pull information together. Um, you'll see here that we use the sort of map to really try and just gently educate people about reuse and thinking about the, the broader benefits of donating well to a charity as well and what that brings you. Um, and all, you know, those, those really good, nice things like just, you know, it means that you're alleviating poverty in lots of different um, lots of different ways, not just, you know, diverting stuff and um, reducing carbon. So we really tried to sort of illustrate that within the content of the map. So we had over a hundred, I think it was about 164 sort of projects take part. It was the first time anyone had bothered to collect data on this stuff, <laughs> um, which amazed me um, because obviously every community has its charity shops. What was totally fascinating as well is that some of the bigger charities were less willing and able to take part in projects like this, whereas the smaller ones we found generally were because a lot of the larger charity shops in Glasgow were quite corporate and were a bit a bit hesitant about, about doing projects like this where they were essentially presented as a whole, which was an interesting thing. I also included reuse projects because again, there are projects that don't have shops that actually are community-based organisations that run bike projects, wood projects, all that type of stuff. Importantly, or one of the things that we felt was really critical to why we did the project, it was about also making the quality of donations better to try and reduce some of those costs for charity shops. So we spent a lot of dark time developing icons in a system to try and help people, give people a guide as to where they could, where they could responsibly donate. So that was small electrical items, because not all charity shops accept those because there's things called pat testing in the UK, which means that you can't pass on electrical goods without them being checked and not all charities have that capacity. So we were trying to sort of do, do that work as well in terms of educating people. So that was really one project that's a, sort of just focused on one theme of, of green mapping, which is reuse. And again, as I say, it's one of my favorite projects because I got to go around a lot of charity shops, um, which is never a bad thing. So now we're just gonna go down the Clyde and back to Danoon. So we're heading west to Danoon. So Danoon is a, is a small rural town that um, was, is very famous for sort of what's called doing the water, so holidays that you take down the water. Um, traditionally, you'd have arrived in Danoon by paddle steamer. So the Danoon grew as a town at the, really as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution because Glasgow, people were trying to escape Glasgow basically because although it was very wealthy, it was very densely populated. And essentially um, the wealth of Glasgow kind of spilled over and people started to build their holiday homes in Danoon. That also required paddle steamers. So it became this convergence of paddle steamers making travel and steam engines more possible meant that towns like Danoon suddenly sprung up along the West Coast. But Danoon has also had for the last sort of 60 years, um, a sort of slow decline. It was rescued, interestingly, by the presence of American servicemen who were here 
who um, used to be on Holy Lock during um, to, to, to they, there was part of part of a, a sort of defence system. So we the town's economy was sort of buoyant for a while because of that as well. But I think now it would it is essentially a few years ago was labelled as one of the most declined towns in Scotland. So I started working uh, essentially as a researcher to uh, and creative to try and figure out ways of using cultural heritage to support regeneration. And one of the projects we did with the local museum was to develop um, a high street exhibition where we took archive material and information about the high street and put it in shop windows, really to re-engage people with the town's history. This particular one, which is a, as a pharmacy, also meant, if you see there's some bottles in this picture, um, one of the things that we discovered was the collection of bottles were because at the back of the pharmacy, there used to be a ginger beer factory. Um, so since then, <laughs> um, fascinated by ginger beer and bottle reuse, we started exploring that heritage a little bit more because it's, it's although it's not unusual because pharmaceut pharmacists and um, soft drinks manufacturing kind of go hand in hand if you look back, um, what was fascinating was that the factory had actually continued to produce soft drinks up until about the 1970s, so through the war, which is quite unusual. So we started making soft drinks again, um, just kitchen sink style, and we started taking those drinks out um, and into the community. And what we discovered was this is a great way of getting people to talk about their community. Lots of people of all ages have a relationship with soft drinks. Um, whether it be people who remember when the factory was open or can relate if we spoke to a number of Americans as well who were here um, on Holy Lock and they had vivid memories of coke being imported into the community and all sorts of things. So it was a great way of getting people to talk. And you'll see we have lots of opinions on flavours um, and it's just become a bit of a, 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 a labour of love. Um, and so we started making soft drinks and then really thinking about how could we make soft drinks again? One of the unique things about soft drinks that were made um, sort of up until the 60s was that you didn't have them in plastic bottles. There was reuse involved and people, you know, took that, that was just the mainstay. So um, what we started doing was really pop making and start to explore the idea of if we brought this back to the moon, what would it look like? And there's lots of benefits to talking also about making pop because pop is a really simple process. It's essentially sugar and flavorings with carbonation involved. But from that, there's a lot of learning about ingredient sourcing and about how you can start to, how you can start to understand the past a bit more. Like where do these ingredients come from? And of course, it's the story essentially of colonialism. Um, so the map that I'm sort of currently working on at the moment isn't just a map of the local community, but it's a map that starts to track some of the ingredients as well. So here we've got Scotland, Moon, and then this is Jamaica. So the original factory that I was talking about earlier, that is hidden behind the pharmacist, and that's George Sterling's original factory. So that's on the map. But here we have um, James Ewing, and James Ewing built a house in Dunoon, so he was one of the rich merchants from Glasgow, but he also owned multiple estates in Jamaica as well, where I so oversaw um, sort of sugar production and obviously was intrinsically linked to the slave trade. So we've got this kind of cultural history here to explore. So the goal over the next um, year is to really project, uh, like use um, green mapping as a tool to sort of really start to um, broaden out our learning about this really interesting heritage and work with our community locally, but hopefully with visitors too, about how we can start to produce soft drinks locally, but how we can do that responsibly and how we can use that as a tool to talk about ethical consumption and production of goods as well. So that's my current project. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. Well, that was fascinating, really a great example for us. And um, I've lots of questions about pop. Um, <laughs> where I come from in Michigan, we called it pop, but I don't think anywhere else in the States does, just for one funny thing. Um, but do other people have questions? I'll let you go, go ahead and ask if there's some questions here. 
I just think it's such a cool way to knit together the heritage, what people are growing, what people remember. It's beautiful. I'm, and I want to say just for a second, looks like Hank Mulder is here right now, who's one of the co-organizers of this conference. It's great to see you, Hank. Thank you for popping in. <laughs> just seeing if everything was okay. So uh, I'll leave you in a second as well. It's not being not interested, but just too much to do now. But uh, <laughs> I hope you're not melting there in the U.S. And uh... Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Well, good luck with the session and uh, good to see you all. Hope to see you in the, the social. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, you know, Hannah touched on what's coming up in Glasgow, and I'm really happy that I'll be in Scotland from the middle of October. Um, I'm invited to the TED Countdown Conference in Edinburgh, and I'm going to stay for the Climate Conference in Glasgow, which starts November 1. So we're just starting to think about what can be done and who else wants to be involved. So there's lots of time to sort that out. But I think it's a really good opportunity for us to touch base. Dan, do you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, I, I'm just thinking about this wonderful um, model of sustaining local economies and reclaiming heritage and history. Um, something that we do um, up in Telluride, uh, we, we sponsor the annual Mushroom Festival, and which is, it brings in a lot of wonderful, diverse characters, but uh, we have coordinated with the local brewery uh, to build our own um, kind of mix that uses reishi and turkey tail as part of the beer. And it's super popular and a super way of raising money for our nonprofit. And, uh, you know, and it helps a lot of the, the locals who are into their brewing and have a hard time competing with the national brands and so on. So it really gives local character, which is the point. You know, that sounds like a really nice celebration. <laughs> but yeah, I think, and I, yeah, I, 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 maybe I need to do a pop festival. <laughs> I love it. A pop, a pop, 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 pop. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mary has something she wants to add. Yeah. When, um, well, I was just wondering, how did you begin to engage people? Which came first, the idea or getting the crowds together? And how did you start putting these things together? Is that to me, Mary? To you, yeah. I'm sorry, I said Wendy, Hannah. Um, well, we basically were, well, I suppose I spent a lot of time um, sort of just hanging out with people who are working in regeneration. I'm independent and I'm not a charity, but my practice has always been around sustainable development. And I've always felt the part of that practice is about you just need to make connections. And so I started working as opposed on a voluntary basis with a local the local council who were doing a project around the high street they had tiny amounts of money to sort of put into public engagement so that's what the exhibition was paid for it didn't i mean to be frank it didn't really pay for the time it was no way but i think when you're doing these things unfortunately there aren't necessarily the mechanisms locally to to fund everything so it takes a lot of voluntary time what we found though was Food, drink are always a great way of bringing people <laughs> together. And there's no escaping that. <laughs> and actually, the novelty, I think, of making pop and highlighting that, that heritage that, frankly, had been really... Although there was artifacts in the local museum, um, it kind of been forgotten about. The building, it still exists, but it's very dilapidated and it's used by another, like, another business. So... Uh, Old, older people in the town definitely remembered it, but younger people had no inkling that, that that was the case. So actually just making and serving stuff and generate, and we turned up at, I basically gate crashed some um, cafe style meetings with my ginger beer. And then the following week I was asked to make some more for a, a, a bicycle launch event. And, and so it was that, and, since then, we've not done lots of publicity, but we've just continued to make stuff. And I think that really helps and have conversations. Great story. Thank you. Thank you. And Fumio, I'm just wondering, can you imagine a process that would bring back those water wheels in Ioni, where you said there were, what, 40 
hmm? water power systems. Could you bring How? that one as kind of a pop thing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> what would you say again? Pop? Yeah. Oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to look at Hannah's example. Yeah, yeah. Example together and thinking they're both water. It's okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but yours well, is power. Could you okay. make artisanal power that people okay. want to come and try? <laughs> okay, so I mentioned to the uh, Setochi town in Kagoshima prefecture. It's a uh, kind of the um, part of the colonial part in the, you know, uh, in, in Japan. And the sugar, it, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a commerce good. And then the relationship such as, uh, you know, uh, Central Japan and uh, Ireland in the, you know, uh, ma ma marginal island. It uh, may be it's a hidden pro issues in Japan. And uh, that's why uh, your uh, project kind of impressed me. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about such a set of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking too. And while I'm thinking, unless there's another question, I'm going to pop back over to this sharing a second and we'll go back to Europe for a minute. Should we do that? There it comes. Um, okay. So just a couple more examples from Europe. Oh, oops. Um, this is Anna, oops, sorry, Lieberman from uh, the city of Copenhagen. She runs the nature school program and she has a counterpart across the way in Malmö, Sweden. They have created a green map for students. But, um, and these are all places that students can go for free. So really encouraging kids to learn outdoors. The nature schools, um, you're outside every day and the kids test better and they're healthier. So it's a, been a very interesting uh, several year program. When, we were, when I was there in 2018, they were plugging the SDGs into their school program. And we talked about making an AR, augmented reality tool. So you could see the SDGs and green map icons together it through your phone, so you'd understand where are the places right through your phone. Who knows? Someday maybe this project will happen. Not yet. Um, in Geneva, uh, which I also where I also stopped in 2018, they had a brand new Sustainable bus. So this bus travels around to the different parts of Geneva and beyond, um, introducing the SDGs on the bus to the kids and doing it through food, mapping, all kinds of things. And this project continues to move forward with um, the Earth Focus Foundation. Um, here in New York, um, oops, the other Europe, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, we've created a map. This is our 2019 cool map where we also introduced the SDGs on the map to people. The idea behind this map was you don't need air conditioning. I need this map today, I, I must admit. Um, the, we also did a, a project in our local park and we invited groups around the park to come and uh, showcase what they were doing in relation to the SDGs. And um, this is, a. Um, um, it was a very interesting event. And one of the important things to me is the lower left picture. We planted the first two of the thousand street trees that I started a campaign for that year. And we now have oh, about 500 new street trees planted since then. So this was the very first tree with the commissioner and everything. It was terrifically exciting. And it's also neat for local groups to see how they connected with What's going on at the UN? It's two miles away. What's happening that's real in our community compared to that? It was pretty fun. Um, so we've been encouraging people to make all kinds of things with our icons. You're not limited to the um, map, as I mentioned. Um, you're not even limited to things that are realistic <laughs> necessarily, like the big uh, phone piece on the right. The idea there is to make a set of stickers, like um, emoji type things. Nobody's had a lot of demand for it, but we did make some sketches to think about how would these be used? How could these be used um, 
in texts and things like that. But all these, everything else here is real and has <laughs> really been made and used in different places. So, um, oops. Let's try our, try out our, let's move on to our workshop piece. So um, this is, by the way, these images are from when Greta arrived in New York Harbor. So I don't know if you realize that there was um, 17 sailboats needing her. She's in the, the big boat, uh, the tall one here, but 17 boats with each of the SDGs met her. And here they are uh, circling the Statue of Liberty on their way into New York Harbor. And I chose those images when I made a campaign. Oh, wait, okay, wait, we'll stop there. Here we are, this is what I wanted. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but that bit.ly, and I'm gonna put it in the chat, oops, is the starting point. Oop, let me put the HTTP on here. Okay. There it is in the chat. Have you tried the campaign tool yet? So if not, we're going to give you a couple minutes to go look at it and add a site to the map. And then we'll show you how to accept that site and teach you some of the basics on how to use it. Now, and if you have anyone has a question while people are doing this, feel free. And I'm going to come over to the map. Okay. Okay, give you another minute. You don't have to do anything too fancy. Um, with it, but it'd be great to see where you all are. So, okay. Anybody sent one in yet? Oh, it says it's slow loading in the mountains. Okay, I understand. I'll give you another minute. First one added is from Japan. You can see on the map here, there's already a couple that we've added. So when a site has been suggested for your map, whether it's with a campaign or another way, it has this little mark, this little black mark on it. See over here in Japan? And I'm gonna click it. I'm logged in and, oh, somebody didn't fill out too much information. So I'm gonna click edit and uh, I can actually change this to somebody's name. Who put this up there? We don't know. So I'm going to just put up um, someone in Japan. So you can see you can add it. And if you want to add a little description, you can do that too. This is a test. Um, if they have misspelled something or you want to enhance it a bit, you can do that as well. Every person, we set this up so every time someone adds a site, it's, it's, it's going to start with the, the stars showing on the map. So all I have to do right now is um, publish it. So up in the upper right-hand corner, I can make it public and save it. And we'll go back and look at the map. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
And now someone in Japan, their test is up there. Now they didn't add a photo, I don't think, not yet. Oh, look at how many more are coming. So um, let's try Anna's and we're gonna go to edit it and we'll see where Anna is. And she didn't add a paragraph, um, but that's okay. And I'm gonna say she's gonna, because she chose this as her first icon, I moved it over. All I had to do was click it and it moved to the first position. It may look like she's out in the ocean. Anna, where are you actually? Hi, no, I'm not in the ocean. Okay. <laughs> I'm close by, but not in the ocean. And I will put my camera on. Sorry to be here without camera. I'm in Portugal, but I don't know oh, why. You are. Oh, yeah. uh, I was trying to uh, make some changes on my uh, input, but I couldn't. So that's why something went wrong. It is in Coimbra. Can you see there Coimbra a little bit uh, north? Yeah, yep. that's close by that. Pretty exactly. close? Okay. I mean, I I'm can... at the University of Coimbra. Great. And you didn't add a photo, but that's okay. Um... Actually, I'm trying to have some ideas for my European research night. I oh. think we can do great things with, with these kinds of applications. So thank they, you. Uh, thank you. Um, what do you, and what is your, what's your research on? Anna? Sorry, she... my sound went, okay, now I can hear you, sorry, yeah. So what is your research on? Uh, I'm from sleep and sleep apnea uh, research field, but now I'm more dedicated to science communication, actually. So I'm coordinating science communication activities here at university. And the European Research Night is one of the, one, the, the biggest that we develop here at university. Very interesting. So now I, we've just added um, another one from Washington State. So Mary's now on the map. And while we're talking, I'm going to turn this over to Hannah, and she's going to give you the basic intro for a minute. Um, we'll add, accept the others that are being added here as well. You can come and test and add to this map anytime. In fact, if you go to the campaign page, you can see all the different campaigns that people have created so that people can very quickly take part in their map and um, share ideas about different places. I see here come bike shops. A lot of these are in Glasgow. That's really been trying to get um, a lot of engagement going in the run up to the COP, which is cool. Okay, so I will stop sharing. And Hannah, do you want to do the basic intro? Yeah, okay. So you should see my screen now, which is the map. Yeah, everyone's yeah. seeing Okay, so this is the world view of the um, Open Green Map. Um, and as Wendy says, you can see the distribution of icons all over the world. If we zoom in, I can zoom in on Glasgow, you can start to see that as you zoom in, you get more visibility about what's actually been put on the map there. So the first thing to be able to use this system is about actually creating yourself an account. So you just do that by essentially submitting your, just registering really. Don't um, and I'm sure Wendy will, will send links out in terms of logging in. And that then gives you the ability to go in and use I don't that. see this. You don't see it? No. Oh, you, we see your desktop, Hannah. Sorry, you're oh. right. I thought you were having a dramatic opening slide. <laughs> no, not Thank at all. You. Just a mock up. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> that, okay. See now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're back on track. <laughs> Apologies for that. Okay, so this is the registration screen basically. So what would you do? You submit your email and a password and then you get an email notification. Now, as a user of the existing Green Map system, I am already um, sort of logged in. So I am just going to sign in here. And then we go back to this great world view again here. Okay. So what, before you make any green map, you have to have a team of people. So your first move when you start out green mapping using this system or using this platform is you go to the little plus sign here 
and you create the team. So I'm going to create a new team. So there's been a lot of talk recently about biodiversity in Cal, so which is the peninsula I live on. So you can see part three. Sorry, my keys are stuck. Actually, it's odd. <laughs> Let's go do that. Okay. And then you can put a little sentence about um, what your team is all about as well. There we go, and then we can add that. And then you have the luxury of being able to add different things like a logo to your team as well. So I can go in here and I could add, say, something there because that relates to biodiversity and that just uploads it. And then if you wanted as well, you could also add in different um, different images that relate to your project. So it might be that, yeah, we talk about that. We'll put that one in there. Okay. Okay, so it gives you the sort of, it's customizable basically. So this will be then your mapping team. You can then, if it's not just yourself, but you have other people that are registered on the platform, you can then add members to your team to create as many people as you want can, can participate. So a team is essentially a team of map makers that are then responsible for a map. So we've got a team now, so that's right there. And you can here, up just up here, you can make this team private or you can make it public as well. So once we've created a team and we've saved it, you can then start mapping. So what we can do is create a map. So you've got a new map. So again, we're gonna create a map about biodiversity. Um, <sighs> oh, it's not a good sign. And then what we can do now, you could add, add different people to your team. So we could do we could actually add you guys to the team there. So now what you've done is you've created a team and then you've also started to um, create a map working with your team as well. So tagline. So you can add different features to your map. So these are the sorts of things that will appear um, when people look at your map on that view, on that browse view as well. So we can put cover images here of biodiversity. Now, the important thing as well is you've got to select using these tools, the geographic range of your map or the geographic area that you cover might be that you want to make a, 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 a um, sort of world map, so you want it to be really big, or it might be like in this case, this one that you want to feature on a very small and specific area. So you click here on the ge geometry, and then what we're going to do is zoom in on the map. This is the bit that I find definitely the most tricky. See, there we go. Because I'm now in the sea. Yeah, we can't see the map part, but you can see it, I hope. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, it just disappeared then. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do is zoom in. By double clicking on the map, you then get to zoom in on it. So I am going to. Oh, it's doing it again. Sorry, Wendy. I don't think I can. Do you want a hand? <laughs> yeah, I can you know, maybe the hand, Wendy. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna stop. I'm just gonna stop there. But basically, okay. I'll fix that while you go on. 
Okay, well, basically, you want to define your area of the, of the, of, of the map that you, you, sorry, you want to define the geography of your map, and you do that using these tools. Um, you hopefully use them better than me. <laughs> um, so. Well, just a little. I'm going to give you instructions so people can see. You're now active, right? The little green, the, the little square above it is turned green. So zoom out a little bit. A little bit more. Wow, where are we? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you have zoomed way in. Yeah, and there this, you go. Then you'll be able to do it once you have it here. So, um, okay, let's look where we are. There's your, is your waterway somewhere? The Clyde, where'd the Clyde go? Oh, I don't this think I'm in Scotland. <laughs> no, that's okay. Here. <laughs> So we need to be over here. Okay. So just go, just put down a click. Don't don't touch. I ooh, just let's just get it roughly in there, so we can. <laughs> okay. But don't. Yeah. There we go. Now so go. I, that exactly. You. Click and it'll make a little square. Or it should. Yes. There we go. Yay. Hello. All right. <laughs> So that says just roughly put in, developed our, our geographic area. Okay, so then- Wait, 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 save below the map before you go on. Yes. <laughs> and, and just so you know, below it, you can choose a license. You can add one in there. You can also collect the embed code. So if you wanna put this map live on another web page, this is where you get that embed code. And that vector tile URL will help you put the map onto something like QGIS from which you can make a print map. So you can go on now, Hannah. Yeah. Um, so essentially, once you've got, so just to go over that then. So you create a team. You then create adding members to your team if you want to. You're then, then creating a map and you want to define the area that your map is, is going to be about as well. So the next thing to do is you can then add a feature. So things, points of interest in this system are called features. So you can go up to the menu there and you can add a feature. So the feature that we're going to add to this map is going to be C Mayweed. Yeah. And then that. Now you should, if you've done it correctly, <laughs> be able to sort of see I'm going to put this onto the visualizing um, SDGs. So as a map maker using this system, you can have multiple maps at the same time. They can cover different geographies. Um, uh, and so that's really helpful if you've got ongoing and numerous projects as well that are using these toolkits. And you can add this feature to one or a number of your maps as well. So we can do that. So when you're adding a feature, so we've called it C Mayweed, and we're gonna go and importantly add the icons. So we're gonna go into nature and flora, and we're gonna look at, I think, it's a native there, okay. But then you can also, so that's a primary icon, so that's the first icon that will appear. And then you can also add secondary icons as well. So it might be that we also, it's part of a, a coastal habitat as well. Okay. So, and then I'm going to add a photo. You could add an STG. I could have actually took me to add an STG, Wendy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, here we can do this so we can see them here. So we've got the United Nations. So they're listed under United Nations. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. And it's very easy to switch between the different kinds of icon sets and you get to see all the icons right there on the on the legend. So it's very convenient. Go ahead. Yeah. So I am just gonna say that. So I've selected my SDG and I put that on there. And if I am feeling very, very uh, up for making my map more interesting, I could also add sound files as well. So there's really lovely things that you could do, particularly if you're interested in capturing people's comments in a different way, or if there's kind of heritage and um, sort of um, if there's oral histories, maybe stuff like that that you're interested in, you could add that there. 
Okay, so we're save, saved there, saved there. I'm not doing that. So that is then my site. And I'm going to make this. The, the trick is to make it public. And then everyone should be able to see that as well. So if I go to now to visualizing the SDGs, on visualizing the SDGs map, we now have C Mayweed. Okay, so that was me adding that C Mayweed. Okay. And I can go back in from this view and I can edit if I want to as well. But it's just a really flexible and easy way of, yeah, using the green map system. So I will stop sharing and hand over to Wendy. So um, did anyone have any questions about that part? I mean, it takes a little practice, but it's actually pretty smooth once you get it going. And it's also pretty easy to describe to other people. Thank goodness. Um, I'm going to go back to my screen here a second. So Hannah has gone over this one, two, three, four, I skipped setting the purpose of your map. This is actually really important um, when you're getting going to think about your audience, what moves them. You know, you have a blank slate. So lots of possibilities there. And also to think about your process. Do you want to involve a lot of people or do you want to keep it very simple? So there's a whole range of um, decisions to make about how you do it. A lot of times, if you're brand new, we encourage people to make a test map with just one or two people maybe and get your um, this way of describing things down and see what works. Um, where if you go back to the map that we just made together, let's see, is it this one? Um, you can see some of us put pictures in. To me, this really adds a lot to the, the story. It shows on this page, um, this is, you know, the maps. Um, it's not, it's the map, because you can link to the map here, but this is the page about the map and it has all the sites. So you can actually read them and explore the sites without going to the map this way. So taking a little bit of extra time to put more in or to enhance things that people have suggested is a great idea. I'm gonna show you how to add a, um, I'm going to add a site um, oh, feature. So we use the word feature. And actually, let me go to the map. I'll show you a different way to, to do it besides the one that Hannah did. Um, we call features lines, points, and areas. And so I'm going to show you how to add a line. And I'm going to kind of fake it because I realize this icon is really covering it up. But let's see, I'm going to go all the way into New York. Um, and we started uh, the project that we did. It started right here at the base of this bridge. So I'm going to hold down my control key and click. This is a right click and I get propose a site right on the map. And that's really convenient for locating where it could be. Propose a site. Come on, baby. There we go. Um, oh, it doesn't have permission to use my location. Uh oh. Um, but we st it's still letting me do it. And it does have my location. If it's not exactly right, I can open this up and pinpoint. Ah, I want to be right there. Tiny bit over. Okay, continue. You also have the option to put it in the address. It's already collected the name of the map. And I'm going to call this um, hello. Uh, okay, um, ride with um, habitat to the UN. Okay, so um, it was a great ride. Okay, and of course I could say more than that, but I was lucky enough to go on a bike ride with the head of Habitat. And here, I'm going to add the picture. And I've already found the picture that I want to use. And I put it in my, oops, my um, desktop for quick access. Uh, one sec. My computer is thinking. OK. Oh, no, it's this one. OK. OK, so um, there's Madame Sharif. And if you're out in the field, you might want to downscale the images for faster upload. You might want to put in multiple pictures. I'm just going to do one. And I'm going to choose a UN icon here. 
And I think I'm going to choose partnerships for the goals. And I think secondarily, I'm going to add sustainable cities. Um, and of course, I can add more icons if I want. And maybe I'll just add bicycle, the bike, the bike one to this. Oh, this is interesting. Something I forgot to do. Okay. In the meantime, I'll add the bike. And I'm going to actually make the bike. I'm hitting save. I'm going to click that bike icon to make it number one. And I'm going to submit this site. So it's actually a two-step process to add a line to your map. So I'm going to show you the bike route that we took. So now it's been saved and it's on the map. But I want to just check, did I pick the right ah, icon for this? So now I'm over at the icon. There's a map that's all about lines and polygons, the areas. And we have connected Aha, a dedicated bike lane. I did pick the right one. We've connected the icons to specific things. So there's a separate chart for this. We'd still love your feedback on it too. Are these lines visible enough? Are they too thick, et cetera? Did we choose the right icons? By the way, if you add your own icon set, you can create your own version of this where you're adding lines and areas. Areas will uh, put a tint on the map. Here, I'll show you how the map looks. Um, here you can see this map has um, areas as well as lines on it. And for, they act the same as a site might in terms of being able to put on a photo or a sound, but they show up as a tint on the map or a line on the map instead of just a point. So let us go back to where we were working right here. My site was saved. I'm going to view that site. And it's going to let me put in one second. Um, oops, I didn't click the right thing. So up here, don't worry, there's the edit button. So a lot of your controls are on the upper right like that. I didn't click the right one, but it was just one more click. And now I can edit. And so I'm going to edit the geometry. So first thing I'm going to do is click the little green square and I've got the whole world in my hands again. Um, now I'm going to zoom in. Remember, we're still in beta and we're still improving things. So it may be the next time you come, you will end up pretty close to where you started from on this map. We'll see how we do. I really want to thank the GIS Collective who's building this for us. And they're if you come to one of our demo days and have questions or wishes, they are fantastic at making your wishes come true, I must say. So here's where we started. I'm just going to draw going over the bridge. And I'm assuming I am going up first step. I might be a little bit off here. I might be on third. But I'm doing this quickly. Wait, I don't like it. Let me start over. And this time I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So it does take a little bit of practice to get this right. If you've used a Strava or a Map My Ride or Map My Walk type app, you can actually use that data and just put the whole file up. Okay, now we're over the bridge and we're going to really go up. Whoops. And I'm starting again. Okay. Let's go over the bridge. And we're going to go all the way to First Ave. And then we're going up to the United Nations, which is right about here. OK. And I'm done. Whoops. And I'm going to hit Save. So now we have our line on the map. And I am going to change it once again from private to public. And then we're going to go take a look at the map and see how it looks comes the map. And now you can see the bike site is showing rather than the SDGs because I needed to select that as the primary icon in order to get it on the map. And like I said, it's totally hidden by this other icon. You know what? I'm going to take this one and I'm going to delete it. Ah! Um, sorry. And then you'll be able to see it. Uh, yes. Okay. Right. 
Oops. Oh. Whoops. We are now on another map. Okay. One sec. You'll get it down. Uh oh. Well, we just had a little <laughs> issue here, but now we're back. And oh, there's the site I deleted. I don't know why it's giving me that, but um, one second, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Here are all the maps. So if you ever lose your, oh, I was on it. If you ever lose all your sites, your maps, you can come back here and you will find your map. Turns out I was on it. So I'm just going to go back. And we're just zoomed way into New York. But that line should be there. Very hard to see on a very tiny line like that. There it is on the map. Okay, so now you can see how you can turn a site into a feature. And if I click here, like I did on any other site, I would get the pop-up on the side. And there's the ride to the UN Habitat with Madam Sharif. So that is how you add a site to the map as this picture comes in slowly. Any questions right now? Okay, so if we close this and zoom out, we'll see that all the other sites are still there except for the one I deleted. All your sites have now been accepted to the map. And so even if you're doing a live event with people, you can have a second person who's a map leader with you and that person can help. Um, they can see Dan and Mary's site. I put on the Flint water because it's such a famous site. There's one in um, Africa that hasn't been accepted yet. So we'll keep accepting these. Why we talk. I don't know if Hannah wants to do that or Fumio. Um, but let's see what's next on here. Oh, I have another slide for you. Okay. Oops. So I just wanted to talk for a second about promoting your map. And as Hannah pointed out, and Fumio also in their talk, when you're engaging the public, you got to go out there, right? So um, we did several workshops last year with people. And it was difficult. Sorry, it's loading a second. There we go. We did, um, you can see that, I think, several workshops as we were creating and testing these tools around our neighborhood. And it was really interesting to see how difficult it was for people. And we found that adding the QR code, that's this checkerboard thing, made it super easy for people. Here in New York, at least, menus have disappeared. So if you order something now, you have to use a smartphone and a QR code. So now New Yorkers recognize the symbol and use it very quickly. We also encourage our team members to add it to their home screen once it was up so they could continue to add sites very easily. So we did some events. We um, got, it got written up a couple places and that expanded the audience. We've, sp I'm, people, different people have spoken about it in um, different kinds of forums like the uh, International Society for Participatory Mapping. We've continued to have our, our forums and they've really been terrific and helpful. And now we've started adding our QR code to other information. So locally on the lower right, we're doing a campaign around air quality. We're just adding air sensors to our neighborhood in advance of a park being taken uh, down and rebuilt. And um, we've added our QR codes there. So every few days, there's another site added to that map by somebody in the community. So it's been a good way to get it out there. Um, here are two examples. The upper one is from Israel, where um, the computer uh, staff support person organized eight schools in March and by May they had completed the map of um, the fourth grade. This was a fourth grade perspective and they had a really interesting challenge from the mayor. The mayor wanted to know what changes young people want to see in the community. So in Hedera, Israel now, there's three, three of the projects are going to be fully funded and there's another 10 projects the kids came up with um, through the making of this map that will be seeded. So they'll get a small amount of money to get it going and test it out. This project will continue next year again with fourth grade and they have 
um, bigger plans to make uh, to start earlier in the year and have it go longer. But I that, think that's really good outcomes from a very quick project like that. And right around the same time in March, Green Erasmus got started. And that's a network of especially European schools that um, have um, semester abroad programs. So these semester abroad programs collaborated on the making of green maps in Azerbaijan, Germany, uh, India, um, Brazil, and Georgia. And they had a press conference last week, and I was really interested to see that they turned it into a business. So everybody had a business-like role in the making of this map on all these different campuses, whether they were involved in the marketing or the product development. Um, so they actually learned about a lot about collaboration as well as business and every person involved had to take on an additional challenge during this time so they had to be vegan or avoid plastics or save water so they had the mapping and this challenge happening at the same time and it was really very moving to hear about how the combination impacted the students um, you can use your map for many, the data you've collected for many things. The map is only one possibility. The two things on the, on the right side, by the way, were created by Mary Hunt in Washington State with her map, and she turned it into this long poster. And Mary has said she can walk into your room and roll that out on a table. And it's very exciting for people to see the, the breadth and the depth of what's going on there. But you can obviously I'll just use it for data collection. It can be a great community organizing tool. It's also really helpful for people who are learning technology and giving them new skills, as well as research, best practices, um, storytelling, etc. So don't feel limited to just thinking I'm making a map, you're actually creating a whole new body of data that you can use in different ways. Um, if you get started and you're wondering where are all the answers, I need to see that tutorial again. The about at the front of the map has all the tutorials, presentation links, all our demos. And we've tried to characterize the demos by um, what got shown during them so you don't have to watch them all. It's, it's actually pretty easy to, to get the piece, get to the part you want because we've broken out the tutorial by the step. This summer, one of our goals is to make a new version of this tutorial, video tutorial, because um, the platform keeps improving and the videos, some of the videos are a year old, so we need to update that. The dashboard, this, by the way, this manage and plus are only visible when you're logged in and that will get you, oops, I forgot to change the wording there, but that's where you um, add your map, your new map, you add your new team member, all those things um, get done very quickly from your dashboard. And the question mark has updates, the FAQ, anyway, well, you can see the terms of use, all those things. So this is top bar is pretty helpful for you at new.opengreenmap.org. Um, and you can also check out the GIS Collective in their blog. They have a lot of technical background on how and why they built it. I actually learned a lot reading them, um, even though I've been right here with them. So from a technical perspective, this is really good. And by the way, the monthly demos that they come to, they're all listed on that about page. We tweet about them, etc. so people know about them. Here's our last slide, and I'm going to stop sharing um, so that we can just have a discussion if anybody has some questions or things they want to add. Wendy, I, I did put a question in the chat about um, a, about a kind of a concatenation of multiple maps. So, for example, if I wanted to look at water quality across the globe with all organizations who have produced maps, could we produce a kind of a meta map that just looked at water quality from all of those partner organizations? Yes. You could. I'm trying to. I'm. I'm trying to tee up so we can see see that. Okay. Um, let me see if I could try that. And the search has been worked on a lot lately. 
and Mary, Mary saying yes, because Mary has <laughs> made a lot of really great suggestions for it. I don't know if you want to add something to it while I'm going to share my screen again. Um, but you can search by the icon. So I'm going to, it automate fear, I'm going to put in water. So let's see what we get when we say water. Does an icon come up there? And, um, oh, not, I'm not doing it the right way. Sorry. Let me, oh, wow. Um, but you can, in the search, show all icons. Let's, let's try that way. I'm just learning how to use it. Literally, this is like a couple, this is not very old. So it's, we're going to search the icons. And do you, there aren't very many that have used the SDG, but let's go to nature, land and water. Um, do you, are you looking for drinking water, water feature, um, Riverside Park? Um, oh, it, it really anything, anything that you know is a, com, is, a, is a fairly typical or common theme. I mean, I, I just threw water in there as an example, but anything that you think might show up in multiple maps. Okay, so here you can see water, that one icon for drinking water in several places. Um, so this looks like it's in Romania, for example. That's great. And so that is a way to do it very quickly. And on the browse page, um, let me go back to the browse page and show you that just one second. Browse, whoops, browse. Okay. I'm sorry about that one slide where I must have then, gotten halfway Could that be <laughs> Can that be exported? Um, so could that be exported maybe. as a? I'm gonna say maybe. <laughs> I say I'll have to find out. <laughs> um, does anybody know the answer to that question? <laughs> uh, it's a maybe. So now I'm selecting all the icon, uh, all the sites. And up here at the top, can you see this search bar? I can turn it into a list instead. Yes. And I, there might be a way to export it all. And if we say uh, icon, again, we get search the same way and get a limited um, example. So for example, let's take culture and society, um, cultural character. Let's just look for child-friendly sites, for example. And all of these, I believe, search, and author visibility search. Okay, let's see. Do I go search? And does it do it? Uh, with this. Okay, close. Wait. I actually, I'm not that good with this, I'll be honest. So visibility, let's say published. And now You're it will give great. us the list, the list of sites that use that child-friendly icon. And it's by proximity. So the ones that are closest That's to great. you will show up first. So you can see they go on and on. And now we're getting to other parts of the world. I can find out if this is downloadable because that could be a really interesting way to start a new map, right? Um, potentially. So I'll have to get back to you on this answer. So you can see zillions of sites that are child friendly. I'll stop sharing and see if there's any other questions. Great. Thank you, Kumiko. Um, Anne, did you have a question, Anna? I have. Can I go ahead? Can, you, can I go ahead? I have a question. Imagine that uh, I would like to know exactly how many people is visiting a specific site or giving some comments. Can I have that data? Can I just know? You can have that data if you embed the map on your own page and have analytics there. But we're not set up for analytics right now. So, okay, but I can embed uh, the, the map on my own page and I can do that. Okay, that's right, right. Okay, thank you. Sorry, that's, um, and, and I'm really, um, <sighs> Kumiko, your idea to use the map for local food loss and waste study in action, that sounds amazing. I know it's a huge problem everywhere. Hey, Wendy? Yeah. You, Go ahead, Mary. Just a comment. Um, what I like about this presentation is not so much a how-to, but what's possible. It opens up all sorts of venues that you, I haven't thought of yet on how I could possibly use this and expand my map out to better regions. So I, I hope that has happened for you all as well. I was going to say the other thing that has come up 
in the work that I've been doing as well is just icons and just how um, certainly for the cultural heritage stuff we're looking at maybe developing more icons and giving back which I think is a really nice thing to be able to contribute but as another way of engaging people in this process and taking them right through to drawing an icon putting it on a digital map to represent something that you know like is, is, is important to them I think is another really you know good use for that so that these tools kind of give you that possibility as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And on our, um, if you go to our homepage, uh, greenmap.org, you'll see local food icons. We are actually testing here. I'll, I'll take us there for briefly, and then maybe we'll wrap up because I know it's a hot day and everybody's got lots to do. <laughs> or maybe time for bed, um, depending on where you are. But we're on the homepage now at greenmap.org. And right here is local food. This is going to move around this box because it's, um, it's a story. But if you click it, um, it's getting really warm in here, you can actually not only see each of these icons, but you can comment on them. So we have a survey set up here by the icon. Do we have the image right? Does the definition make sense? Is the title correct? We really want feedback on these because we've had a lot of requests for things around local food. And um, so made these live, connecting with the permaculture movements and transition towns, so many other movements are food organized. And I have to say Mary's map, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, Mary's map uh, up in Washington state has really been such a great example not just for her region but for us and you'll see in the demos some of the tools she's created to help you manage your map so it's been really terrific to um, grow in this way and this is what I want to say to all of you please share what you're learning because it's going to help everybody else who comes next so thank you for that it is oh it's 87 in my office oh so that's right on the edge of like overboil. <laughs> I'll put on the AC at that point, but this is this is I'm right at the edge. Who else is too hot and ready to go? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I so appreciate everything that Fumio and Hannah did to and all the students. My goodness, thank you so much for everything you did and everybody who added to the conversation. This has been terrific. Does anyone want a last word? I just want to say thank you for everything that you've done, Wendy, from the years in the past and everything that's come along at this point is just such a wealth of knowledge and work. And that's really inspiring. Thank you, Mary. You know, the world is in a not in a good shape at all. And the more we can do locally and globally to help to work towards climate health and everything else that the SDGs in, encompass at this time, it's super important. So thank you all for dedicating so much of your time to it and to thinking about how we can do more in the future. Um, we'll send you back a link to the video and again in the slideshow. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I just want to say hi, Wendy. Hi, Hannah. I haven't oh, met you hi. before, Hannah, but I'm very much looking forward to getting started in Ireland. So um, see you in the autumn. Oh, oh Rebecca. Hi. From Orkney. Oh, Orkney, I think. Oh, you and Enid got to talk. You two are working in parallel in some ways. Enid's oh, up in the former coal fields. You're in the, let's get in the peatlands. Peat yeah. Yeah. Wow. Grace, where are you, Enid? Sorry, hello. Hi, where are you based? I'm in Scotland, in Fife. Right, okay. Yeah, but, Great. Um, my, um, the charity I work for supports um, a number of different areas, like East Ayrshire, Fife, Middle Lothian, East Lothian, West Lothian. Um, right. So, we, we, we just work to, so we, currently what I've been doing is helping communities create action plans. Yeah. To help identify what the key priorities are. 
But right. at the moment, the, the latest work that I'm just taking on there, I think this might be a helpful tool is a behaviour change project, which Definitely. is about um, encouraging people to walk and cycle and yeah. Yeah. feel, you know, anything that's right. similar. Well, I'd love to chat with you more, Ian. It. I'm aware that um, Hannah and Wendy probably want to get on, especially Wendy there, sweltering away. <laughs> oh, I can put the AC on. It's okay. Um, no, I'm thrilled that you're meeting. I'm happy. I can share your connect connect you That's all great. by email. Can you do that. Yeah, the three, the three in the UK. I'll do that too. Thank you. And Dan, you're sure. still here, and you have a friend. No, yeah. this is. Uh, oh. I wanted to introduce my wife, uh, Lori. Hi. Lori. Uh, Lundquist, who's uh, also an artist, and environmentalist, and so we're both on the Telluride Institute board. And um, quick question, if I may, um, on a project that uh, involves uh, mountain partnerships uh, between uh, multiple countries uh, sponsored by the UN. And I'm wondering if there might be a way of developing an icon that uh, focuses on mountain communities and um, uh, you know we're right in the process of about to embark on creating a map of mountain communities and this would really be a wonderful tool for that process uh, and it has added sort of connection with the UN which you already have established a connection with Wendy and that would be wonderful to see how that might there might be some synergies in that relationship i don't know if, if you have been able to garner support or tap into resources recently with the un um, monetarily publications whatever uh, but i think there might be some synergies here that would be great um we have not gotten funded by the un we were i it's i dates all the way back that we were named a best practice i can't tell you it was still the 90s that we were included in things. And here and there I wow. go up and take part in things, but the UN process is very slow and it's focused <laughs> in maybe a different way, who knows? But we would love to help you uh, or be part of this. Chip, Chiprian, who sometimes is on, he built our greenmap.org website. He's based in Romania and used to work with Carpathian.org and so, he has a PhD in environmental management and is he would research where are certain salamanders and amphibians in the mountains do field work. And yeah. those were the indicator species of an intact ecosystem. And then Carpathian.org would buy that land to preserve it. So those species told them where to buy not all the land and so this is um a huge effort to save the carpathians from you know loggers etc there's a lot of issues there um so that's he great might, he might be interesting to talk to and i will say bogdan and alexandra who are the developers of this platform they're in berlin but they're also romanian they're now working on an app and an app will allow somebody in the rural area to collect data and wait till they're back in the Wi-Fi zone to upload it. So right now we don't have the ability to use our tools offline. I mean, you can go out and take pictures and things like that, grab GIS um, uh, coordinates with a walk my, you know, map my walk type app or whatever you're using. But Hopefully, once that the app is ready, it will actually make it much easier for people in rural areas or areas with low bandwidth to um, participate. So that's that's one of the hurdles they see, but we're, they're working on it. And we got a sneak preview. Who, whoever came to the last demo, we got a sneak preview of the app. And it's going to be very nice in that it's also going to notify you when you're near a map site. So if you turn that on, and people who are out in the country can find out where they're when they're near oh. a mountain community. But we have a little experience with mountain communities. We'd be happy to share what we know. I don't know if Enid or Rebecca, Fumio or Hannah want to add anything to that. I'd just like to piggyback on that and say, wouldn't it be great to offer peatlands? For the peatlands, yes. Yeah. So they're in central Ireland, right? The peatlands? Yeah. Yeah, and they cover four counties, the central ones. They stretch from East Galway over to um, Kildare, so heading towards Dublin. 
and then there's other bogs in Mayo um, along the west coast. Yeah, but predominantly they're centred to the west and in the middle. Yeah. And, and there's, oh, I just realised we're still taping. We, oh no, we're still recording, so. We, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just. Yes. To... Go ahead. If, if I may, I'm sorry to keep jumping in. We're in the, we're of also developing an app and I got some funding through the EPA to do this. And so it, it would make a lot of sense to have a conversation and maybe join forces because uh, honest to God, this is uh, absolutely parallel with what we're doing here in the Rockies. And so um, I have a development team at Arizona State University working on this starting last week. So we're right at the front edge. So it's the perfect time to collaborate and connect. I was going to say as well, Wendy, I think the rural dimension is something that's really overlooked uh, a lot. So, you know, as someone you know, coming at you from a, a more rural community, it's really good, I think, for those projects to connect. Um, because I think it is, it's increasingly a challenge um, and something that's a bit of an inclusion issue, spatial inclusion, <laughs> inclusive. Um, and perhaps also thinking about areas that on the green mapping is not so prevalent in sort of large swathes, swathes of land masses where there's not an uptake, that's really important. So I, I just kind of feel that that's something to, I'd definitely be interested in the conversation about that too. And, and going back to peatlands, I think Scotland is full of bogs too. <laughs> and, yes. and actually, and actually it's, it's becoming really evident that those places are really important to preserve. I mean, there's the flow country story, which is really interesting in Scotland and um, how the economy and economic incentives destroy peat bogs, the people who think and replace them with trees. <laughs> um, and there's a really interesting narrative there. So uh, we'll talk at some point, Rebecca, as well. Yeah, um, definitely, because we're just about we to, have, uh, we have... um, to see if we can apply for biosphere status. So we're just about to start that yeah. with a Scottish company, uh, Luke Landu Services. They've, they've yeah. done lots of work on the Somerset, Somerset levels and things like that. So that's going to be a really in-depth and um, really exciting study. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's lots of opportunities for I mean, institutions to get involved, isn't there, with that sort of thing? And, and because it's so... It's so rich in terms of the scientific kind of um, study that can be done of those things. So hopefully, you know, in terms of your project, which is very much about job creation and all these other things, that that to me is where these links kind of need to start happening, isn't it? That yeah. the knowledge exchange happens both ways and Definitely. people are enabled to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Just we this have... group here, the incredible potential is, I'm so excited. <laughs> But the and I love the scope of your work, Rebecca. The the what you laid out earlier, and um, and I don't know if you want to say just in a couple minutes. It's it's breathtaking. Okay, <laughs> I'll try. So we've been set up as a direct response to a government seminar, which was how do we empower communities in the fight against climate change. So what we're doing is we're doing um, a double prong thing. We're taking something from Wales because I lived and worked in Wales before and love the development trust model as a regenerator. So we're taking the development trust model and we're using it on a county-wide basis. And we're going to implement projects um, using the development trust model, but through a green lens. So everything that we do, say if we'd be regenerating a building, it would have to be run on renewables and the landscape would have to encourage biodiversity. Uh, looking at creating green and social enterprises leading to long-term job employment and just basically looking at how we can interact with our unique landscape but in a way that we can live and work in it as well you know it's like just seeing how we can form that relationship mm -hmm. with nature yeah. live in it not have it separate as a park not something we visit but something that we're centered in and living in on a day-to-day -day basis so it's a very quick description. I love it. It's fantastic. And I know Enid's work is very different from that, but still has this fossil fuel at the be at the base of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, and how you how people deal with the after effects of communities have been set up because of the fossil fuel, which is now no longer able to, you know, to supply 
um, support for these communities. And, and um, But one of the things that I'm interested in talking about is the idea of working with young people. And then a, a lot of the young people in the communities that I'm in have no um, bigger picture of the world. Yeah. And I that, you know, Green Map would be a great opportunity to introduce people to young people to a bigger perspective by linking in with other youth projects in other countries yeah. and just letting them see that there's more than just the village where they live you know there's there's a bigger picture and wood in their horizons yeah yeah, yeah. oh sorry go ahead i was sorry i was just going to say and i think there is the resource i think it's about because I think just the work that I've been doing with Wendy over the last year, I think there's an awful lot of resource that isn't even like on the website or doesn't necessarily come through in terms of projects and films, particularly films, so Fumio's films that are showing young people interacting with green maps. And it's almost as though like a show reel for young people might be something to, to sort of think about and, and stuff. Because I think there's a universality there of wanting to find roots into this stuff and actually I think there's, there's some amazing work going on in Cuba with young people. The video we watched last time, Wendy, yeah, was just like f absolutely fascinating. Really? Uh, and, taken. Yeah. and in Cuba, the Cuban map maker is working with, um, well, that's Liana, and she's working with Natalie, who's in Belgium. We're working towards a youth exchange, and Baltimore is involved already in a couple other places, but that is a 2021 goal is to get that started. And I've started to like re, re amass what have we created that's about place-based learning. And so hopefully later this season also, Hannah and I can work on that. There's a lot of work to do. We're in, we're, in a one. we're doing a pilot in the autumn um, with Eco UNESCO Youth for Sustainable Development. So we're looking at establishing like a real youth kind of activism headquarters and kind of like the Prince's Trust, but for the green, the green things. So yeah, we're in on that oh, definitely. That is super cool. I love it. When you're worried that you're going to expire yeah. with the heat. <laughs> yes, I'm going to expire for you guys. So before that happens, we're at the two hour mark. I would never thought this would go that long. So thank you. This part's been thrilling on top of everything else. Again, thank you to Fumio. You know, it's bedtime. I'm assuming Asai, he's ready for bed. It's, uh, uh, it, it's a midnight, uh, midnight and tomorrow morning I had a classroom, so I say good night, everybody. Thank night. you very much. Good night, everybody. More to come. Ciao. Well, I have to exit swiftly too because my kids are back. So um, anyway, Lovely to meet you. All right, stay in contact. Bye, Bye, Wendy. Take care. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you, Lena. Wow, this is great. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Ned. Be in touch. Bye, Wendy.